If you were forced to play the hardest escape room ever made, where every wrong answer will get you killed, what would you do? This death game has one of the most disturbing storybook endings you've ever seen, and that's why I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every puzzle in Play or Die. This man may not look like it, but he's a stone cold killer. Lucas here is an escape room legend, and Chloe, his ex-girlfriend, has just found a new event called Paranoia, which is giving away 1 million euros to whoever finishes their escape room first. That's enough to set both of them up for life, but she needs his help to solve the first clue. She tells him that she heard two black swans have mysteriously gone missing from the local zoo, and a black swan happens to be the logo of the escape room company. It can't be a coincidence, and when she called the zoo to ask about it, she received a secret message that said 24, be careful. It's clearly a clue from the game, and Lucas here quickly figures out that if you change each letter into a number, the code turns into the zip code BD23. Looking online, they find the zip code belongs to a place called Skipton City, and on the town's website, they discover that the escape room is being hosted at the exact same mental asylum he was committed to when he was a young boy. Chloe is surprised that he was able to solve it so fast, but she'll soon discover that this is no coincidence. Okay, this was some really quick thinking, and it's no wonder this guy is an escape room legend, because it took him all but 5 seconds to figure this out. By simply changing every letter of the alphabet into a number, it pointed them to a zip code, and he barely even broke a sweat. But it's also kinda suspicious. If I were trying to solve this puzzle, I would have tried changing every single letter of the code, because it would be a pretty dumb code if there are a bunch of unused letters in it. If you were in this situation, I'm pretty sure you'd be racking your brain to try and figure out what the hell this ridiculous code could even mean. It could be a serial number, or the ISBN of a book in a library, or a million other things. There's nothing here telling us which letters are important and which ones aren't. And there are so many ways to get this answer wrong, that when you look at how fast he solved it, you have to think there's something wrong with the situation. It's just way too convenient, and I would immediately be suspicious of him. He also just told us that this escape room is being held at the same mental asylum he was committed to as a kid, and that should be concerning. If it's true, then this guy must have some pretty serious psychological issues, and that might not be the person you want to find yourself trapped in a room with. I think this guy knows more than he's admitting, and it's going to get really twisted because they're about to enter the most dangerous escape rooms they could ever imagine, and they don't even realize the game is rigged. Driving through the woods, they arrive at this old hospital where the game will be played, and this place is creepy as hell. They go inside and enter a dining room where they're surprised to find several other players who found the clue just like they did, and are competing for their chance to win the money. Suddenly, they all hear an announcement officially welcoming them to the game, and a man's voice tells them that this hospital is full of escape rooms created specifically for them. With every room they complete, they'll be given a piece of a jigsaw puzzle, and only when they've collected all of them will they be allowed to leave. The players accept the terms, and with that, two staff members wheel in carts full of handcuffs, and the game begins. Okay, as soon as the handcuffs come out, I'm standing up and getting the f out of here. Now don't get me wrong, everyone would love the chance to get rich quickly, but there are some serious red flags I'm seeing that turn this into a hard no. First of all, nobody knows where we are. We don't know who's running the game, or if they can be trusted, and we wouldn't be able to ask for help if something went wrong. This ex-girlfriend is ignoring every warning sign because she's trying to play this game like it's the lottery, but she's not thinking about what makes this so much more dangerous. As a business model, this game makes no sense, and if someone wanted to watch 6 people play escape rooms for entertainment, they don't need to spend 1 million euros to do it. Whoever has that much money to hand out under the table like this would not be doing it unless they're getting something of greater value in return. And this is the biggest red flag of them all, because it's pretty clear that the real game has yet to be revealed. You should be terrified by what you'll be asked to do that makes it worth so much money by the end. We can't even trust that we would get the money if we did win. Since we're being lured out into an abandoned mental asylum where we won't be able to call for help, I would at least have some sort of safety mechanism in place so people could find me if I went missing. Even in the age of smartphones, stories of unsolved missing persons cases are all too familiar. Just take this example from 2014. 43 students went missing in the Mexican state of Guerrero during protest, with only 3 students being found to this day. If 43 students can disappear in the blink of an eye, a person stuck in the woods with no phone reception is going to be very easy to make disappear. Later, the man wakes up alone in a room handcuffed to a pipe with no idea how he got here. That's when the announcer tells the players that they must find their teammate to stay in the game. Meanwhile, in her own separate room, Chloe here has heard the same announcement and spots a key on her bedside table. 
Reaching out, she grabs it and tries to unlock her restraints, but it doesn't work. The key must be for something else, and she has no idea how to get out. Next door, Lucas slides his handcuff across the pipe and makes his way to the other end of the room until he finally spots a key balancing on a shower head. Carefully reaching for it, he's able to grab it and free himself from his restraint, but he still needs to find a way out to reach his friend. Looking around, the man spots a vent on the wall, and realizing that it might be connecting two rooms, he pops off the cover and calls out for Chloe. She answers him, saying that she found a key and it doesn't fit any of the locks in her room, but that gives this escape room genius here a great idea. He asks if the door in her room has a keyhole, and she says no. Lucas here realizes that if there's no way for her to get out from the inside, then the key must be for him to set her free. He tells her to throw the key through the vent so he can help her escape, and she reaches her arm in to throw it over to his side, but it doesn't go all the way through. Struggling, Lucas stretches his arm and just barely manages to get a hold of the key. Unlocking a drawer in his room, he discovers two doorknobs and another handcuff key inside. This is exactly what they need to escape, and Lucas is able to use the knobs to leave his room and to also rescue his friend next door. He sets her free from her handcuffs before taking the puzzle piece and clue for the next room. Okay, this is a lot more intense than your standard escape room, because all six players here were drugged and handcuffed in order to start the game. For all they know, they could have been moved to a completely different location, and that should be freaking us out. It really tells us that once you've agreed to play, the game designer is already 5 steps ahead of you and has complete control of the situation. If you look here, the windows are barred with iron mesh, and there's even a security camera on the wall, so there's probably not going to be any easy way to cheat or skip steps. Now, Lucas was extremely smart to realize that this key was actually meant for him, but that being said, throwing the key into the ventilation like this is super risky. Both of our lives are riding on this key here, and there's no way you would just casually throw it like this because if it gets stuck in the vent, then it's game over and you're done for. We need a way to guarantee that this key doesn't get stuck, so if I were Chloe here, I would be looking around the room to find something to help me solve this problem. The best thing she has to work with are her shoelaces, because she still has a free hand to untie them, and if she takes the laces out of her shoe, she could tie one end to the key and wrap the other end around her hand. This would let her try to throw the key down the shaft as many times as she needed without worrying about it getting stuck. Now, if they were wrong, and the key was actually meant for something she had to unlock in her room, then he could easily send it back using the same shoestring. In escape rooms like this, everyone usually wants to take the quickest approach, but sometimes reacting too quickly will blind you from the consequences of that decision. They'll both be finding out very soon that this is not the kind of escape room that you want to take these kinds of risks. People are going to be dying some really brutal deaths if they don't win, and one lost key could be the difference between 1 million euros or being thrown into a laundry basket with a screwdriver shoved down your throat. These guys need a better hobby with a much higher survival rate, and the best way to do that is to listen to the Sandman Act 2 on Audible. Guys, if you don't know, last year Audible released the audio production for the number one New York Times bestseller, The Sandman. It's based on the DC graphic novels written by Neil Gaiman, and already has tens of thousands of 5 star ratings. Now they've just released Act 2, and they're inviting you to enter the dreaming again and journey into a world of myths, imagination, and terror. With an absolutely epic ensemble cast led by James McAvoy as Morpheus, Lord of Dreams, and including Emma Corrin, Brian Cox, Kat Dennings, John Lithgow, Reggae John Page, Kristen Schoel, Michael Sheen, Jeffrey Wright, and so many more, the blockbuster audio adaptation of the greatest epic in the history of comic books continues. At Audible, you can find the largest selection of audiobooks. They're the best provider of spoken word entertainment, and with a free trial to their Premium Plus service, you can listen to The Sandman Act 2 as soon as you sign up. It's never only a dream, so go to audible.com slash dreamlord to claim your 100% free one-month trial and listen now. Thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video. Together, they look at their next clue, and he tells her they have to find room 7. Walking down the empty corridors, they finally reach the room, but when they both step through the threshold, the door slams itself shut. Surprised, the man tries to open it, but it's completely locked down, and he realizes they'll need a digital code if they want to break out. They turn around to find their next escape room, and that's when they notice a screen instructing one of them to lie down on the bed. The woman asks if they have to put on these restraints, and the screen instantly answers yes. Without much choice, Chloe volunteers to be strapped in, and Lucas helps to tie her down into the bed. Suddenly, this rack full of knives lowers from the ceiling right above Chloe, and they start to panic, as they realize this is not the kind of game they were expecting. Lucas here wants to set her free, but that's when the woman notices a two-minute timer start to count down. The knives drop even lower, and it's clear she's going to die if he doesn't find the puzzle and solve it. 
The man hurries to a wall covered in magnetic cards, and flipping them over, he discovers that the pieces have black markings on the back. He starts to rearrange them as they begin to reveal a picture of a black swan. But time is running out, and the knives are getting dangerously low. That's when Chloe sees a row of numbers on the frame of the device, but since the knives are blocking her view, she'll only be able to see them clearly when the rack gets closer. By the time the man has finished the puzzle, there's less than 35 seconds left, and the woman is able to read out two rows of numbers. The top row has 5, 30, and 6, and the bottom row has 3, a missing number, and 7. Lucas realizes they need to find out what that missing number is, and with 10 seconds left, he figures out the pattern. The middle number is the left and right numbers multiplied together, so the missing number is 21. At the last second, he punches in the code and the knife rack raises back up as a drawer suddenly opens. They've solved their second escape room, but this game is going to get so much worse from this point on. Okay, these two should be ashamed of themselves. If this guy is such an escape room genius, I don't see how he could have missed that this bed is obviously a death trap. You don't even have to look carefully to see that the bed clearly has a rack of knives above it. And if you walked into this room, it would be the first thing you'd notice. Now, we still need to strap her in, because if we don't, then the escape room game won't start, and we'll just be stuck in here with no way out. If it were me, what I would try to do is use a side table here and place it over her on the bed. If you look at this closely here, you can see that this rack of knives is being lowered down by a cable. So the only thing that we need to block is the actual weight of the rack itself. As long as we have something to block the knives from ever reaching her, she should be perfectly safe and we can solve the puzzle without any stress. The one downside of this is that if the rack of knives doesn't lower it down far enough, the girl won't be able to see the numbers that are written on it, and that's a problem because they need those numbers to solve the escape room, but I think this is still easy to beat. When Chloe first noticed that there were numbers written on the rack, it was still pretty high up, so she definitely would have seen the numbers even if he put this table here to block the knives, and Lucas could have just gone to take a look himself to figure out the code of the digital keypad. This solution seems to be pretty obvious, because the table is the only thing in the room that you can even move and interact with, but this gives me an even better idea. We can't forget that there are other players in this game, and they might find the same solution as we did, so what I would do is take the side table out of the room so that they can't use our strategy. They might die, which is pretty cold-blooded, but if you're not willing to do what it takes to win, then you shouldn't be playing at all. Setting the woman free, Lucas asks her if the prize money is worth dying for, but she doesn't answer him. Instead, she reads the clue in the drawer and tells him they have to go to room 11. She quickly leaves before he can say anything, and the man has no choice but to follow after her. They enter a room and come face to face with another group who also received the same clue. Only one team can play the escape room at a time, so the players race to get to the next puzzle, but Lucas and Chloe are too slow. The other team manages to get to the room before them and lock them out. They're both upset, but that's when the woman hears piano music playing in the distance and the players follow it to another room. But as they step through the doorway, it slams itself shut behind them. With nowhere else to go, they walk further inside to find a large room with a man playing Swan Lake on the piano. Lucas thinks the pianist might be just a distraction, and they decide to check this bookcase for clues. Searching through the books, the man finds the musical scores of Swan Lake on each shelf. The first one comes after four books, the second comes after seven, and the third comes after nine other books. That gives them the three-digit code of 479, but when the girl tries this combination on the padlock below, it doesn't work. Desperate to find another clue, Lucas spots Edgar Allan Poe's purloined letter and remembers a quote from the book. That's when he realizes they've been searching in the wrong place. Turning around, he sees that the pianist has disappeared and runs to the center of the room. The flames are getting higher, but the man quickly plays the Swan Lake theme, and as soon as he does, the bench pops open. Looking inside, the woman finds their next clue, and they finally solve the puzzle. With the room burning to ashes, they run out before a massive explosion nearly scorches them. In the hallway, the ex-girlfriend asks Lucas how he knew to finish the song on the piano, and he tells her that the purloined letter was a hint. In the story, Edgar Allan Poe wrote that the best place to hide something is in plain sight, because nobody would think to look there, and the most obvious thing in the room was the piano. Okay, this is getting out of control. Setting fire to the building is really taking this to a a new level, but there were a few easy things they could have done that would have made a huge difference. The worst mistake they made was rushing into another escape room unprepared. In the last room, the door closed on them without warning and trapped them inside, so when they got to this room, they should have expected the exact same thing to happen. If I were in this situation, I would have tried jamming the door with something to stop it from closing before going all the way inside the room. 
Now, the people controlling this game might not let you do this, but it's not like they handed out a rulebook to us, so we won't know what we can get away with until we try it. This gives us a backdoor exit in case things get too intense, but we still need a strategy to solve the puzzle. The good news is they had an easy answer and it was right in front of them. This guy playing the piano works for the escape room, and you can be damn sure that as soon as the place gets set on fire, I would run to tackle this guy and threaten to trap him here unless he tells me how to solve the puzzle. We need to use every source of information we have to get out of here alive, and there's no way I'm letting him leave without answers. Now, there's still one detail here that we should all be terrified of. If we think back to when the game first started, the announcer told the players that these escape rooms were designed specifically for them. All of these players completely ignored that like they didn't even hear it, and it's probably one of the most important sentences in the whole movie. Somehow Lucas knew a random quote from this book, and it was the key in helping him solve this puzzle. But nobody else could have done that, because who the hell reads Edgar Allan Poe anymore? It makes you wonder how the game designer could have possibly known that he's read this book before, because something here doesn't add up. Most escape rooms want you to use your raw intelligence and not pre-existing knowledge outside of the game. At this rate, I would honestly be terrified to find out what the next room has in store, because this is starting to get really unfair. Searching for the next room, the girl reads out the clue, and it says we are all equal in the face of it. Lucas realizes that death is the answer, and that means there's only one place in this building they could go. Finding the autopsy room, they walk inside, and just like before, the door shuts behind them for the third time. These guys are really not learning their lesson. They quickly realize there's a dead body in the middle of the room, but when Lucas goes to uncover it, they find it's actually a mannequin. The woman finds a keypad on the wall and notices that this time it has both letters and numbers. Lucas picks up this deck of cards from the clown's hands and looks through them to see if any are missing, but things are about to get really screwed up. Behind him, his friend checks this bin in the corner of the room and finds bloodstains on the sheets, scaring her away. He asks her what's wrong, but when he pulls back the sheets, he finds the dead body of one of the other players. This has officially become a terrifying death game, and that's when someone starts pounding on the door from the outside. Lucas tells his friend to use the gurney, and she pushes it against the door just in time to stop it from opening. Examining the cards for clues, he holds it under a red light and notices markings appear on the sides. Rearranging the deck, he discovers that the markings spell out CA2107 and quickly comes up with a plan. He gives the cards to his friend while he holds the door shut, and she punches them the sequence, unlocking the cabinet where the jigsaw piece is kept. Their time has run out, and they quickly leave the room just before the door bursts open. Okay, this is nerve-wracking, because there's clearly a killer on the loose in this hospital. If other players are showing up dead, then we're going to be next. So if I were Lucas here, the first thing I would do is take that screwdriver out of this dead woman's neck and arm myself. The fact that they're still trying to solve this puzzle is actually pretty stupid, because the room itself is not a threat to them. In the other escape rooms, they had no choice but to solve the puzzle, because otherwise they would have died. Here, the only threat they're facing has nothing to do with the puzzle, so it's not the priority right now. This room also has no timer, so it would be much smarter to deal with the threat first, which is right behind this door. Now, confronting the killer might seem scary, but we definitely have the advantage here because the attacker has only one entrance point and it's the perfect setup for an ambush. If we just solve the puzzle and run away, we still have a dangerous killer that might follow us into every room after this. I don't want that to happen, so the real benefit here is to see who's behind this door and if we figure out how to stop or kill them, then every puzzle afterwards is going to be a lot easier for us to handle. Clearly this game has no concern about its players dying, so any murder we commit from this point on can be seen as self-defense. None of us had any clue this would turn into a death game, and since we're being trapped here against our will, we can't exclude murder from our list of tools that we have to win this game or escape it. Running from the killer, they make it to the stairwell, and Lucas finds out that Chloe didn't have enough time to grab the clue from the room. Now they have no idea where to go next, but that's when they hear whistling from above. It's the theme song from Swan Lake, and whoever was trying to break through the door is still following them. Terrified, they run out of the stairwell and through the hallway. They turn a corner where Lucas spots an open door and runs through, but it quickly locks itself behind him before the girl can catch up. He's just entered a puzzle room by himself, and there's nothing Chloe can do to help him. Suddenly, she hears the same whistling from the stairwell, and it's getting louder. The killer is catching up, and she runs away, leaving Lucas behind, but the man doesn't realize that he's not alone. As he slowly backs away from the door, a pair of hands reach out and grab him from behind. He's about to experience the worst escape room of them all. 
Lucas wakes up restrained to an electric chair and a leather strap wrapped around his head. For this puzzle, he will be told 11 nouns along with 11 adjectives and the announcer will test his memory by asking him which adjective belongs to each noun. He'll have to memorize all 22 words on the spot if he wants to get out of this alive, because every time he answers wrong, he'll be electrocuted. With those instructions, the announcer starts to read out a list of words, but they're going too fast and Lucas can't keep up. He tries to memorize them, but by the time it's finished, he's barely able to remember half of what he heard. The voice begins the test and asks him which word was matched with dark. He answers dungeon correctly, but when the voice asks which word was matched with flying, he guesses incorrectly and gets brutally shocked by the electric chair. With every wrong answer, the shocks get more intense, and by the time it's all over, he's been shocked a total of six times. He's in so much pain that he can't respond to the questions, and that's when a nurse walks in. She's told to finish him off for good, but Lucas has one trick up his sleeve. With his last ounce of energy, he frees his hand and takes a jumper cable off his chair to shock the nurse to death. Suddenly, a drawer pops open, giving him the jigsaw puzzle. He didn't solve the riddle, but he still managed to escape the room, and with that, he's given the next clue. Getting up from the chair, he walks out of the room and goes to look for his friend Chloe. Okay, the only reason this guy is still alive is because he cheated. The fact is, memorizing 22 different words instantly is a lot for anyone to handle. Based on scientific research, most humans aren't able to hold more than 7 things in their minds at one time, but there's actually a great trick to beat this game and I'll show you how it works. The trick is to first pair each word to another object that's easier to remember, and then combine those two things to form a mental picture. Your brain is really good at storing lots of information in a single image and it helps you recall things a lot better. For example, if you can't remember someone's name at a party, next time, try linking the name with a piece of clothing or even one of your favorite movies. This method builds stronger connections in the brain and you'll be able to hold a lot more information in your head all at once. What's fascinating here is that this is such a common technique that people even use this trick in the World Memory Championship to quickly recall hundreds of items in a matter of minutes. Now this game is the perfect chance to use this trick because it's already pairing a noun with an adjective. All Lucas here needs to do is forget about the words and just convert them to pictures. That way, instead of 22 things to remember, he only has to imagine 11 pictures. For example, instead of trying to remember both the word dark and dungeon, he just needs to imagine the image of a dark dungeon and one single memory is storing double the information. These are the 11 images he would have needed to remember. A dark dungeon, a mysterious mother, a cold corpse, a buried treasure, a colored circle, a flying soul, a black cross, a sick mind, an absent presence, a violent wind, and an innocent murderer. Now look at these images, because they represent 22 things that Lucas has to remember. It might seem overwhelming, but if I now suddenly remove these images, can you tell me what color the cross was? Most of you would be able to, and if I asked you what kind of dungeon it was, you would probably answer correctly. Lucas here only needed to remember 5 in order to pass, and if he calmed down, he wouldn't have been shocked or had to kill this woman in the first place. Lucas here walks through the halls and finds himself in an abandoned chapel. He finds Chloe sitting on the ground and her hands are covered in blood. She says she found one of the other players laying here injured and tried to save him, but there was nothing she could do. Confused, Lucas demands to know what happened to her when they split up. She tells him that the killer captured her and she managed to escape, but it sounds pretty suspicious. She tries to distract him by giving him a hug, but he insists they should focus on getting out of here. Moving towards the body, he finds a deck of tarot cards in the dead player's hands. The girl points out that tarot cards sometimes have biblical symbols, and since they're in a chapel, it could be a clue. Chloe examines the paintings hanging on the walls while Lucas looks at the cards, and he finds one that shows seven evenly spaced branches. That's when he realizes that this must represent the seven rungs of Jacob's ladder that ascends to heaven. The woman looks around, spotting a painting of Jacob on the wall, and when she raises her hand over the image, a light slams on in the second floor across the chapel. Walking over, they find a rope ladder nearby and climb up with no idea what to expect, but then suddenly, the woman stops moving. She apologizes to Lucas and he never sees her betrayal coming until it's too late. He's kicked off the ladder, falling hard on the floor as Chloe climbs up. She's fully intent on collecting the 1 million euros for herself. Taking all the jigsaw pieces they've collected, she assembles them and discovers the passcode to the exit. Entering the numbers into a keypad, she walks through a door and leaves her ex-boyfriend behind to claim her prize. Outside, Lucas searches for the woman and he's shocked when he finds her leaning against a tree, bleeding from a fresh wound. He realizes the killer must have attacked her while she was trying to escape, but she's lost too much blood and there's nothing he can do to save her. 
the woman passes away from her wounds and leaves him all alone. Furious, he searches the woods for the killer and finds a masked man waiting for him nearby. He knows this is the killer that took Chloe's life, and the only thing Lucas wants to do now is get revenge. The two men get into a fight, but Lucas gets the upper hand and manages to take the killer to the ground. The man slowly takes his mask off, and Lucas stares in horror as he sees his own face looking back at him. That's when the evil twin drops a massive bombshell. Lucas created paranoia to lure his ex-girlfriend Chloe to a place where he could kill her after she dumped him. He was the one that murdered the girl in the autopsy room and the man in the chapel along with all the other players in the game. This man has been suffering from a severe dissociative mental disorder. Suddenly, all of Lucas's memories come flooding back to him, and we see that he used to be a patient at this mental hospital when he was younger because his mom abused him. She kept him a prisoner in their house for years, raising him to be a genius, until he finally escaped and stabbed her with a screwdriver as she was listening to Swan Lake. That's where the song and the bird were featured in the death game. The trauma and guilt from that moment inspired him to use his genius and build this elaborate escape room to let his dark side reenact his trauma and explore his psychotic fantasies. He can't accept the truth, but he knows this evil twin is just a figment of his imagination, and in a fit of rage, he strangles him to death. He calls the police and pretends to be a victim, telling them a masked killer murdered the other players. The cops take his word and let him leave the crime scene, with no idea they're letting the criminal get away. Finally, he gets back home from a busy day at work, and now with no girlfriend to bother him, he gets the best sleep he's ever had. But what do you think? How would you be play or die? Let me know in the comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the how to be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.